Yes, uh, hello again. Uh, we were discussing the main characteristics of object oriented languages. And uh, we the first point was abstraction and we talked about the class. The class is really the abstraction mechanism that is used in uh, object oriented languages. So the next time the next uh, uh, item to talk about is subtypes and then inheritance and dynamic binding. So subtypes we we introduced this concept of subtypes when we were talking about abstract data types earlier. So subtypes, uh, the type, what is a subtype? The type associated with the class T is a subtype of S when every message understood from objects of S is also understood by the objects of T. And remember we had a, when in, in our discussion on abstract data types, we had a data type called new counter 2 which was a sub uh, subtype of the counter data type because uh, uh, every message understood from up from the uh, from f for counter or every function uh, every operation that we could apply for for new for counter uh, we could al also apply it to uh, uh, to new counter too uh, we can we can uh, say it a little bit differently. We can also say that T is a subtype of S when the interface of S is a subset of the interface of T. Uh, because if the interface of S is a subset of the interface of T, it means that every operation that we can apply to uh, S, we can also apply to T because the interface interface is really the uh, tells us what are the operations that are available uh, we can also say that if an object is represented as a record containing data and functions and remember it really contains the data but it contains a pointer to the functions the subtype relation corresponds to the fact that T is a record type containing all fields of S as well as possibly other fields. So T is actually larger than S. Sounds a little bit contradictory because it's a subtype, but that's how it work, uh, that's how th this concept works in object oriented languages. Um, the the subtype T that we are declaring is larger in the sense that it has all the functionality uh, of S but it has some additional functionality so that's why if we look at it as a record the record for T is larger than the record for S the record for T contains all the fields of S but in addition possibly other fields now this was our example class from earlier, uh, our class counter. I just put it here uh, for convenience again. And now we come to the concept of subclass. Uh, and the, the subclass is uh, a class that uh, it depends on some other class and the fundamental characteristic of the subclass mechanism is the ability of the subclass to modify the definition meaning the implementation of a method present in the superclass so we talk about a superclass and a subclass and this mechanism is called method overriding so if we needed to define a new class that somehow modifies the definition of uh, a method in the in the superclass we can do it by by using a subclass by introducing a subclass so in our pseudo language here we have class new counter which extends the counter class it, it has its own um, variable called num reset which has this a function of keeping track of how many times uh, the object has been reset. This is exactly the same function as we uh, uh, the same function that was in the in the abstract data type that we looked at earlier. And then 
it overrides the reset function by saying not only x is equal to 0, but num reset is equal to num reset plus 1. And then uh, it has its own function how many resets, which is not defined in the counter class. Notice in the counter class it has a reset function get and increment, but the new counter ha overrides the reset function and introduces its own um, function called how many resets, resets which just simply returns th this variable num reset. And uh, if we just go back to, before continuing, we go back to uh, my example here for the counter that we saw earlier. Uh, now I can take out the comment for new counter. And if we just look at how new counter is implemented here, let's look at the interface first. Uh, in C++, one introduces a subclass by using the colon, so I say class new counter public counter. Um, we'll look at this comment later, but um, the new counter has its own constructor. It has its own reset function because it redefines that method. It has its own how many resets, which the counter does not have, and it has this who function that we will talk about a little bit later. On the private side it has its own num reset field or member or instance variable. In the implementation in the constructor it says sets the num reset to zero. In its reset function which is remember is a the purpose is to override the functionality of the reset function in the counter class we first here explicitly call the reset function in counter. This is a little bit different from what we had on the slide where it says simply x is equal to zero, but that's exactly what the reset function in counter uh, does. It says x equal to zero. So instead of duplicating that code, I simply call the reset function in the superclass. And the how many resets function simply just returns the num reset. So this is simple. It's a simple class that uh, uh, is a subclass of counter. And how do I use it here? I introduce, I declare a variable of type new counter called nc. I, um, let me just comment this who out for a moment. Uh, I call the increment, f I sent the, or to, to use the uh, correct uh, terminology, I should say, I sent the increment uh, message to the NC object, which in turn will execute the corresponding method. I'm sending a message which will invoke the method. I do it three times. I write out what the value is by calling the get, by sending the get message. I sent the reset message twice and I sent the get message to see what the uh, va what what value the counter has after that and finally I sent the how many resets message to the new counter object and uh, return them so let's uh, compile this and run and I get, as we got earlier, the counter has value 2, then the counter has value 0, it has 2 because we incremented it, has, and then it has 0 because we reset it. Then the new counter has value 3 because we incremented it 3 times, then I reset it, and after the I reset it, the new counter has the value 0, and the number of resets is 2 because I really called reset twice. So, uh, now we come to inheritance. 
So we we talk, we we we're just talking about uh, subtypes and subclasses. So what happens when a subclass does not redefine methods? Uh, well, then the subclass inherits the methods from the superclass. Uh, so the implementation of the method in the superclass is made available uh, to the to the subclass. So we can say that inheritance is a mechanism which permits the definition of new objects based on the reuse of pre-existing ones. And if we go back to our example, uh, inside new counter, I did not have to specifically state that functions like get and increment were part of the new counter. They are automatically, they're automatically uh, inherited because new counter does not redefine them. It does re redefine the reset method, but it does not redefine the get method and the increment method. Uh, so what is this, if we look at the relation of in inheritance versus uh, subtype relation, is there a difference there? Yes, there is a difference between these concepts. The concept of subtype has to do with the possibility of using an object in another context. So it's a relation between the interfaces of uh, the two classes. It's a relation between the interfaces. Remember how we defined the subtype T is a subtype of S when the interface of S is a subset of the interface of T. So every operation that I can apply to to S, uh, a value of type S, I can also to apply to a value of type T. So a subtype, the concept of subtype, is a relation between the interfaces of the two classes. The concept of inheritance has to do with the possibility of reusing the code which manipulates an object. So this is a relation between the implementations of the two classes. It's important to, to, to uh, uh, understand this difference between the subtype relation and the inheritance relation. However, in many object-oriented languages, for example in C++ and Java, these two concepts are linguistically associated. They are obtained through, both obtained through subclassing. They're obtained by using the subclassing me mechanism. Even though these two concepts are completely independent. So, but, and notice that in most object-oriented languages, if T is a subclass of S, then T is a subtype of S. That, that is of most often the case. Uh, I said most often the case, but because it doesn't hold every time or for all languages. So if we, if we look at uh, inheritance of subtypes in C++, uh, when we define a subclass, or derived class as it's called in, in C++, we are introducing the inheritance relation. Uh, but we're also introducing a subtype relation when the derived class declares its superclass as public. So that would be the case here. If Let's say we have a class A here, and we have a class B, which is a subclass of class A, and it is declared here with the keyword public. So in that case, we're introducing a subtype relation. So it means that whenever we can, uh, whenever we apply an operation to a value of type B, we can also apply the operation to a value of type A. However, when the base class is not public, as we do in the, the last example here, class C colon A, without using the keyword public, the derived class inherits from the base class, but there is no subtype relation. So A is not a subtype of C. And now, 
let's see if we can see uh, exemplify this here in this example so we are saying that if T the class T is a subtype of class S then whenever a value of type S is expected we can use a value of T instead so in our example I have a function here called who which expects a value of type counter now if and I'm calling who here first with the value C which is of type counter and that of course should work and what inside who uh, the member function who is called for the given type but I'm also calling the who function here with a value of type new counter how is new counter defined it is a subtype it is a subtype here because I'm using the public keyword if I compile this the compiler allows me to it doesn't complain the compiler doesn't complain because because the new counter class is declared as a subtype of the counter class by using the public keyword here if I drop the public keyword I save it and I recompile then the compiler complains it says a counter is an in an is an inaccessible base of new counter so I can't call the foo function with the um, value which is of type new counter because new counter is not a subtype anymore and the technical reason here is that when when I declare something which is not public I am not using a, a public keyword here the default is actually then private and private means that everything all the methods and the member variables in counter actually become private in new counter and if they become private in new counter it means that inside a function like who here I might not even be able to call a function like who because it's private so the operations that I can apply to the counter class are not anymore applicable to the new counter class so the new counter is not a subtype anymore of class counter so this is the reason so if I want subtyping in C++ I have to say public here and then everything is fine now then we come to the last point the last uh, characteristic of um, object oriented programming and that's dynamic uh, binding and this is really uh, at the heart of the of the object oriented paradigm it allows compatibility of subtypes and abstraction to coexist really and this is something that we uh, saw that was problematic for our abstract data types earlier we were not able to put for example uh, both a counter and a new counter into a an array and then have a loop that loops through the array and calls the reset method uh, because there was static uh, association between the reset method and the code 
we what we needed was dynamic binding to bind the code at the runtime to the correct object. So when a method m is invoked on an object O, there can be many versions of m possible. There can be a like a reset method in the new counter object, and there can be a reset method in the counter object. So there can be many methods possible, and the selection of which implementation to be used at runtime um, is really a function of the type of the object receiving the message. So if we do, uh, if we send the message m to a counter object, we want the to run or invoke the count the uh, m method that is defined in the counter class. If we send the message m to a, a new counter object, we want to invoke the method m that is declared in the new counter class. This is what is dynamic binding. And so if we assume that new counter is a subtype of counter, as we have been uh, exemplifying, and we assume that both counter and new counter are stored in a data structure whose type is their super type, meaning counter v100. So the super type is counter. And then we can apply the reset method to each of these. Then we can have a loop that loops from 1 to 100 and call uh, the reset method uh, for each of the elements in the array and the correct reset method will be chosen at runtime because we have dynamic binding. So dynamic binding assure us that the correct method will be invoked on any counter uh, and notice that the compiler will be unable to decide what will be the type of the object and therefore, we need this dynamicity. We need to do it dynamically. The compiler has no way of, uh, at compile time, to find out what will be stored inside this object, in, in, inside this array. It has to check that there has to be a runtime mechanism that checks what is the type, what is the exact type uh, inside this array and then call the correct uh, method at runtime. So finally if we go to our example here notice that if we go to the definition of this who method inside counter it's declared as virtual Virtual in C++ specifically tells the compiler that the method should be associated with uh, uh, dynamic binding. So binding the method to code at runtime. And then I have the same definition in new counter. So the definition is uh, we have dynamic binding there as well. So what happens in main when we call the who function with the counter as a as a, a formal parameter or an nc as a formal parameter then at the runtime the correct implementation for who is chosen depending on the type of the object here so when i run this i get i am a counter first and then i get i am a new counter So I call the foo, fun foo function with c. c is a counter object. So at the runtime, the correct who method is called. The one inside new counter, sorry, the one inside counter that writes out I am a counter. In the second example, we call who with uh, uh, a value of type new counter. The correct one will be chosen at the runtime which is the one in new counter, which writes out, I am a new counter. And notice in C++, we need this virtual keyword. If we remove the virtual keyword, 
for from both then we are telling the compiler to statically associate um, this function with code and that means when we execute c.who we are not using dynamic binding we are doing st static binding there and then the compiler just uses the type that is declared c is of type counter so it means that the who function that will be executed is the who function in counter let's double check that compile it and i run it and then i get i am a counter and i get in the second time i am a counter again not i'm a new counter because we didn't use dynamic binding we didn't explicitly tell the compiler to use dynamic binding so let me change it back to this the way it was Everything is fine now.